Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the third debate of Easter 2013 here at the Cambridge Union. Tonight we are delighted to be hosting, in collaboration with the Cambridge University Conservative Association, the debate, This House Believes the Welfare State is Unsustainable. And our first speaker in proposition is Freddie Gray, Assistant Editor of The Spectator and a well-known commentator on conservative issues. Freddie. Good evening. Thinking about tonight's motion, I was reminded of a good story I heard about when Ian Duncan Smith took over at the Department of Work and Pensions. He asked his permanent secretary if he could find out exactly how many benefits there were in this incredibly complicated system. The permanent secretary went off and came back and said, so we think it's about 54. He went off again, he came back again, and said, we think it's about 56. And then he disappeared again, and then he came back again and said, he was very sorry, Minister, but we actually have no way of telling how many benefits there are in this system. That is what we are dealing with when we talk about the modern welfare state. It is a system that has become so monstrously complicated that even the people who run it can't understand it. It is becoming a bit like American healthcare, a thing of such Byzantine complexity with so many different entrenched bureaucratic interests that it is almost impossible now to reform. I expect our opponents tonight will accuse us of being free market zealots, evil Thatcherites perhaps, that we want to demonize the poor, that it is socially divisive to want to radically transform the welfare state. Well, it is inevitably a divisive and painful subject. But as far as Britain is concerned, to say that the modern welfare state is, not, is unsustainable is just not a right-wing position anymore. Any reasonable person can see that it is not sustainable. It is unsustainable fiscally, it is unsustainable politically, and it is now unsustainable morally. I think the people on my side are going to talk more about finance, but let's talk very quickly about what actually is involved in government spending on welfare. One in every four pounds of government money spent is on welfare. According to some analyses, we spend more on direct government benefit than any other country in Europe. Such a huge, gigantic investment would be worth it, and thus sustainable, if it were effective. But here's the thing. It's not. In terms of value for money, in terms of what politicians call delivery, we're not getting much. Under new Labour, welfare spending increased by some 40% in real terms. And yet, during the boom years of the noughties, the number of households in which nobody worked actually doubled. The modern welfare is, is failing most spectacularly when it comes to trying to achieve what it was set up to do, and that's get people who can work back to work. Both the Labour and the Conservative Party agree, in fact, now, that the welfare system can disincentivize work. And in fact, work doesn't pay. And due to the arcane structure of some of our benefits and tax credit systems, it is now some of the poorest people who are subject to some of the highest rates of tax. And I think while the least privileged among us are trapped in welfare, the middle classes have become increasingly dependent on benefits to live in the lifestyle to which we have become accustomed. The latest available figures suggest that about 20 million families are now dependent on some kind of benefit. That's about 64% of all families in the UK. 10% of tax credits go towards the richest half of the population. And some of the highest earning families in this country still qualify for state support. This may be in keeping with the old labor ideal of universality, but it is obvious madness, particularly when we have an indebted government. It is obvious madness to support some of the most comfortable people in society 
Well, we fund a system that makes low earners worse off and discourages working age people from work. Ian Duncan Smith is trying to introduce bold and simplifying reforms. The universal credit, which I'm sure we'll discuss a lot tonight, looks to bring, the, bring together the various manifold benefits and credits into one taper system. But already his agenda has run into huge administrative problems and come unstuck. The pathway plan, as it's called, to, reform, to introduce the reforms gradually and cautiously really does run the risk of creating a twin track system and introducing yet more complexity into it. We're already hearing dark rumors of IT catastrophes and administrative disasters in the pipeline. Labor are licking their lips. But while the parties disagree on the answers, there is in fact quite a broad political consensus about what we're talking about this evening. And that is that the status quo, the modern welfare state, is at present unsustainable. Just listen to the noises coming from the left on welfare. IPPR, the influential Labour think tank, is calling for a radical reshaping of social security in the service of controlling costs and rebuilding popular consent. At the party level, Liam Byrne, the Shadow Work and Pension Secretary, says he's eager to restore the contributory principle to the heart of the system. He remains very vague, however, on how that would work. But the point is, is that Labour is recognising that voters will not accept a party that supports the welfare state as it currently stands, because it is in Labour heartlands, after all, that many people are most angry about the welfare state. Many commentators on the left are quick to dismiss public disgruntlement about welfare. They want to say that it's a sign that people have been brainwashed and panicked by an evil Daily Mail-led campaign to betray all benefits claimants as feckless sponges and shirkers. But this not only gra greatly exaggerates the role of the media, it ignores the basic decency of British people. Historically, during recessions, public support for welfare has in fact increased. But during the current slump, the public's attitude has soured. Have we all suddenly become heartless neoliberal extremists? Of course we haven't. It is simply that real people, as opposed to the other species that work in Westminster, actually have to live in society. And they can see the negative impact that the modern welfare system is having not just on the country at large, but on the people it is designed to help. And that's why polls consistently show people do actually support Ian Duncan Smith's reform. And often it's only when they're told that it's the evil Tories coming up with these ideas that they change their mind. We had a frightfully and typically shallow media row recently about the case of Mick Philpott in relation to benefits. Philpott, you may remember, was the man who killed six of his 17 children and then tried to blame it on his ex-girlfriend. He was being paid around £60,000 in benefits. The Daily Mail called it a parable of our times and everybody got very upset. There were howls of outrage, particularly when George Osborne waded into the row. He was accused of cynically and disgustingly exploiting a real tragedy for political gain. And of course, he was doing exactly that. But what's more disturbing and more disgusting is that actually the Chancellor had a point. Philpott was an extreme and unique case, a delusional narcissistic maniac. But his example does show the extent to which the modern welfare system can be abused. And we would be naive to think that others are not similarly abusing it. Yes? Well, I mean, when you look at the actual number of people who are actually receiving this kind of amount, the number of people who are, the number of families who are receiving, um, say, I think the, the Tories will mention, for instance, six-figure um, incomes due to benefits. When you actually look at that, the, the proportion is tiny, really. So I can't see how that's a reasonable example of what's going on on average at all. And when you look at benefits um, fraud, the most figures seem to suggest that it's sort of much smaller than, for instance, tax avoidance and evasion. I don't think, uh, fraud, is, I don't think fraud is the biggest problem. Um, I do, however, think there are abuses within the system, and there's also great errors within the system, and I think the statistics back that up. But I, I think my broader point is that 
Philpot, Phil, Phil a, a terrible case like Philpot, is uh, a parable of our times in some way, even though it's not a particular example of, uh, of the average welfare disaster. But the point is you don't need Philpot to dismantle the arguments in favour of the welfare state. You don't even need the Daily Mail. What? Forgive me and my ignorance on this point, but I'm a little confused as to how exactly Phil Potter is an example of taking advantage of the welfare state. He had 17 children. That's, if you think about it, six three-person families getting an annual 60,000, so the equivalent of 10,000 for every uh, three-person family. How exactly is that taking advantage of the system? Well, I believe he didn't, often he didn't give any of the money that was given to him towards his family. I'd say that is taking advantage of the system. Sorry, that's quite a That's not about the system, that's about what he chose to do with his partner. <laughs> well, yes, but I, I think he does show that the system is open to abuse. I d I th it's quite easy to react very piously and say that and say that it's and say that it's a sort of shameful example of I'm not demonizing the working class. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. But I am saying that Philpot is an example of how the welfare system can be abused. And I think it is naive to say there are not people out there abusing the welfare system. Everybody knows it's happening, and that is why the welfare state is unsustainable as it is. But as I say, you don't actually need scare stories, or even Terry Philpot, or even the Daily Mail, to dismiss the merits of the modern welfare state. The current system actually condemns the poorest people to living lives devoid of work and meaning. We are actually now betraying the fundamental principles of the welfare state, as established by Beveridge. Beveridge wanted, the social wanted social security to tackle want, disease, ignorance, squalor, and idleness. The modern welfare state categorically fails to do that. In some cases, indeed, and I'm afraid to say in Philpott's case too, it actually increases want and idleness. What to do about the poorest and most vulnerable peoples in our society is a question that haunts any moral society. But if we are to be a moral society, we must accept that work is a social good. And we must also accept that the modern welfare state, no matter how good its intentions, fails the poor. It hampers upward social mobility. And it gives too much support to people who don't actually need it. It is a system we cannot afford that doesn't work. The modern welfare state is unsustainable. It is a failure. And the sooner our politicians can publicly agree on that, the better. Thank you very much, and it's now my pleasure to introduce Kate Pickett, author of The Spirit Level, professor at York University, and co-founder of the Equality Trust. Kate. Thank you, and good evening. When I was asked to speak in opposition to this motion and to think about why I believe and want to argue that a modern welfare state is sustainable, I actually thought back to the words of Gandhi, who when f was asked famously what he thought of Western civilization, he said, I think it would be a very good idea. And so of course, Gandhi wasn't talking about our art or the wonderful architecture that surrounds us, literature, culture. What he meant by civilization was the way we behave, how we behave towards one another, individually, how we behave towards other societies, how we behave collectively. And I think he would agree that a marker of true civilization is how we look after and support and nurture the poorest, most vulnerable, and most needy among us. Not how we care for those at the top, but how we care for those at the bottom. 
There are lots of aspects of our modern welfare state that are generally supported and that we all agree are great. Our health system, the fact that we have social care, high quality education, you know, across a wide range of age groups, and pensions for those who've finished work. But the popularity of social support for those poor and needy and vulnerable has become less popular. And that is a problem and a rather uncivilized one. We are told a lot of myths, of lies, and of misuse of statistics that I won't label as evil, but I will call mendacious and an attempt to actually sway opinion and to paint those who need our support as feckless, reckless, and undeserving. We are told by the media and indeed by ministers that the poor are poor because they don't want to work and they're lazy. Whereas we know the majority of children in poverty are living in houses where somebody works. We know that over 90% of new housing benefit claimants in the last year are in houses where somebody works. We're told that the poor are addicted to substances that cause their problems when fewer than 4% of those claiming benefits suffer from addictions to drugs or alcohol. And we're also told we can't afford the welfare state we have or the welfare state we might want to design. But of course a society chooses. Every nation chooses how it spends its resources. It makes decisions. If we choose to go to war, we always find the money. If we choose to do quantitative easing, we do that, we actually make money. The money that we spent on quantitative easing has raised the incomes of the top 5% of our population enough to pay for job seekers allowance for 100 years. Our public bailout of the banks could pay for job seekers allowance for 150 years. It could pay for what is spent on benefit fraud for 1,000 years. We make choices about the resources we have. And other nations make different choices. Other nations, often with lower levels of economic growth and gross domestic product than ours, choose to support a modern welfare state that sustains and supports their economies and their people. We don't have to look to the typical um, usual suspects even of Scandinavia. Our bankers, you know, our top bankers, make twice what the top 1% of people in Switzerland make. Our top 10% of earners, if they earned what the top 10% in the rest of the European Union make, um, they'd still be enormously rich. But with that extra resource, we could create full-time jobs for every single person under the age of 25 today who doesn't have a job, and we could do that 10 times over. So we can make choices. I'm rather glad that Freddie mentioned Ian Duncan Smith because I think when we're thinking about the myths that we are peddled, when we're thinking about what we're told, we do need to think about the sources from where those numbers come. And The Economist said at the end of last month that numbers are floating out of Ian Duncan Smith's office into the public debate like raw sewage. Questionable numbers. And statistics should be for us an objective, clear lens with which we can look at our society and debate what should be done, not to be twisted, to change our attitudes, to try to bend our opinions. So let's not talk about numbers anymore. I think more important than thinking about the detail of can we afford this piece of the welfare state or can we afford that piece, it's first to think about what sort of society we want to live in, first to envision it, then to ask how we sustain it and afford it. 
And there, I think, Freddie was right to mention the British people as people who are thoughtful and people who can be compassionate. And I bet most of us here today try to live our lives with a sense of values, and that for many, many of us, a central value is the golden rule. We try to treat others as we would wish to be treated. And when you stop thinking about that at an individual level and start to think about what that means for a society, then I think Rawls's thought experiment of the veil of ignorance comes in really handy. So Rawls challenged us to think about a society, about designing a society. Yes. Felix Bungay, Sydney Sussex College. I think you'll find if you read Rawls carefully, he's actually a critic of modern welfare state capitalism, and he actually advocates an alternative of his own, a property-owning democracy, he calls it, and a theory of justice. So, and Rawls certainly isn't a fan of the welfare state. In fact, he thinks it's demeaning that people should uh, not work in a sort of more democratic workplace uh, and should have control over the means of production rather than uh, being given handouts by the government. So Rawls certainly isn't a fan of welfare or welfareism at all. I think that's an erroneous example to bring up, really. Thank you for the point. Thank you for the point, but my claim isn't what Rawls believed or didn't believe about the welfare state, just that his thought experiment about the veil of ignorance is a challenge for us to think about how we think about society. How do we design a society into which each of us would be happy to be born either rich or poor, either intelligent or not, either of high social class or not. And we need to think about that because although most of us in this room might like to think we're intelligent and we are rich, probably by the standards of society, we might at any, need, at any time need the support of others. Any one of us can become ill at any time or disabled, be unlucky enough to have a child who needs special educational needs. Yes? But this is not a debate where we seek to set out a generic case either for or against a welfare state. We all accept there is a need for one, as you've mostly elucidated for the past five minutes, but it's a debate about the detail, about what is the best means by which we should do those things. And I think the argument should be centering around is whether a current massive direct tax on the population and subsequent income transfer the best way to help people. And I think the answer is probably no. Thank you for sharing your <laughs> suggestions. Thank you for sharing your suggestions. I hope that you're never in the position of saving assiduously and finding out that your pension pot has gone bust. And I hope you're never in the position of being unable to find work. But many of us may, and most of those who receive benefits will move in and out of contributing to society and in and out of needing our support. Thank you. I do think there are lots of things we can do once we've envisioned the idea of a modern welfare state that supports those who need it in an inclusive, humane, and generous way to make that sustainable. We can tackle tax avoidance. We can tackle loopholes. We can tackle taxing wealth or land. We can choose a more progressive income tax establishment if we wish to. Colleagues tonight are going to talk about wages and housing. So sustainability of our modern welfare state simply requires us to have the vision, commitment, and leadership to create whatever society we believe is civilized and supports the greatest number in as far as it possibly can. And so let's return to Gandhi and think what he meant. Would he view our society today as civilized? The decisions we're making about welfare and about change. I think he would want us to think carefully about what sort of society we all want to live in. And I think he would want us to work hard, as hard to create that as we seem to be working hard at the moment to dismantle those principles that Bevan set for us so long ago.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we're now going to go into our first of two rounds of floor speeches. So if you could just wait for a microphone, begin with your name in college, and try to keep your speech to one minute or less. Could I get a speech in proposition of the motion? Would anyone like to support the proposition of the motion in a one minute speech? OK, can I get a, please. Uh, hi, uh, Frederick Lewocki. Um I was really interested to hear um, the second speaker talk about the misuse of statistics after rattling off a group of statistics that I have no idea how to understand. They were uh, the, the spending on quantitative easing and how that related to the spending on welfare. I mean, this is, this is meaningless for anyone in this room. If we're going to have you know, debates about good statistics, well, let's just have simple ones at least. Thank you. And could I get a speech in opposition of the motion? Could go over here. Thank you. I'm John from Homerton College. Um, I'd like to raise your point about um, simplifying the welfare state. Uh, recently, one of the professors in our department tried to work out how many courses were at Cambridge University, and we have no idea. <laughs> you can't even give a, give a number. Um, big organizations are complicated. Um, they're not simple. And when you say you want to simplify it, you want to, if we saw the examples of simplifying the welfare state, where people received good benefits, then we might believe you. So for example, with disability benefit, that's recently been simplified. And the new test is, if you can raise both arms above your head, then you don't get benefits because you can sit and work at a checkout. I mean, if I apply for a job and work at a checkout, the fact I can walk around and I can move both arms is very useful and you're expecting somebody that can just raise their arms with their head but can't hold and sit still for hours to compete equally on a job field like Mick with me is simply something you can't ask. So your reforming of the disability benefit has resulted in people who genuinely need help not getting it. And when you see one example where you failed to provide for people who need help, we don't believe you when you want to simplify the rest of the examples. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And would anyone like to make a speech in abstention of the motion? Go over here. Uh, Ahmed Ali, Fitzwilliam College. I'm a little confused so far because the title of the motion is This House Believes the Welfare State is un, um, well, sorry, Unsustainable. Now, are we arguing that a modern welfare state isn't good or that what we currently have isn't good? Because I think we definitely have problems in our modern welfare state, in our welfare state today. For example, in the NHS, there's just too much bureaucracy and not enough money is going to the actual healthcare. Now, that is not an argument for removing the NHS. That's an argument for dealing with the problems in the NHS. So I, I'm kind of confused by what we're arguing here. Is it to remove the welfare state or is it to improve what we have? And if we're going to remove the welfare state, then what will replace it? Because at the end of the day, we do need to care for the poor in this country. Thank you very much. We're now going to return to our main speakers, but we will be having another round of floor speeches in just about 20 minutes or so. Our next speaker tonight is Ryan Bourne, who is a former Cambridge student himself and is the current head of economic research at the Centre for Policy Studies. Ryan. My man, you've just taken my first point. Um, of course, we aren't debating tonight the desirability of the welfare state. We are here to talk about the sustainability or otherwise of the welfare state. Nor should this debate, I hope, be just about comparing today's Britain with some sort of pre-welfare state of the 1940s, or just focusing on what the coalition has done so far. We are, of course, a much richer country than we were in the 1940s, and absolute poverty has almost been entirely eradicated. And whilst the coalition is indeed restraining spending in many areas, it has not fundamentally challenged the consensus of the welfare state. Consider this fact. 
state spending in 1935 on the stuff we consider the welfare state was 11% of GDP. It's now nearly trebled to 30% of GDP, despite us being much richer. We have a universal healthcare service, free at the point of need, universal education, universal state pension provision, a benefit system in which 44% of, of working age households get a benefit other than child benefit. Cool. I've got a... um, <laughs> it's interesting being sitting here. Um, you made the point that absolute poverty has been eradicated. I spoke, I spoke to a support worker, uh, so I'm someone who helps out people who are out of work last week at a food bank, and they were saying that one of their clients, one of their clients went to the food, sorry, they went to the food bank for the client. They were saying their client has absolutely nothing in their cupboards, absolutely nothing, some tea bags and maybe some milk, but absolutely okay. nothing else. They're paying for electricity, heating, gas, food, blah de blah de blah They can't afford food, and they're on 90 pounds a week. So it's a lie to say I'll, absolutely I'll, I'll get to that point. I did say almost entirely eradicated, so um, not really a point of information as far as I'm concerned. With, with, <laughs> with social care and child care, the coalition has actually extended the scope of the welfare state. So what this debate is about, then, is whether we can afford to continue on the path that we've been on for the last 70 years. There are, to my mind, three key forces which suggest that we can't. Our immediate debt crisis, the cost pressures of an aging population which nobody's mentioned so far, and the effects of globalisation. Now, at the moment, the UK is borrowing £120 billion per year. We're spending over £700 billion. The coalition is very much still relying on economic growth to bail it out and eradicate the vast majority of that deficit. But it's become increasingly clear in the fallout of the financial crisis, that our underlying trend growth has been diminished. And with spending on total social security, health and education alone coming to well over half of government spending, when the next round of spending cuts has to come, it's simply false to believe that we're, not, we're going to be able to totally insulate the welfare state as it is at the moment. To see how entrenched our deficit is, listen to these facts which I obtained from the Office for National Statistics. The number of households who receive more in benefits and spending on health and education than they pay in taxes was 43% 10 years ago. It's 53% today. That's an extra 3 million households and net recipients of the state. The average household, the average household in 1990 was a net contributor to the state to the tune of £1,700. The average household today is a net recipient of the state to the tune of £4,600. Many believe the welfare state is about redistrib redistribution from rich... I'll, I'll leave this one. Many believe that the welfare state is about redistribution from rich to poor. At the moment, it's redistribution from the future to the present. But even if we had a balanced budget now, we could still have this debate, and that's because of the effects of our ageing population, which will, on unchanged policies, mean much more spending on pensions and healthcare paid for, by the way, by an ever-shrinking proportion of the working population. Healthcare costs alone are instructive here. The Office for Budget Responsibility figures, which are optimistic on healthcare productivity, suggest spending on healthcare will double from 8% of GDP today to 16% by 2060. In other words, on unchanged provision, the cost of this in state pensions will mean that taxes or borrowing will have to remain so high that they start having an adverse impact on economic growth. Academic work shows every 10% increase in the spending burden reduces growth by about one percentage point per year. And since economic growth alone is what allows us to fulfil the promise for each generation to do better than the previous generation, it's surely the case that politicians won't find it acceptable to leave the welfare state in its status quo. At the same time as these cost pressures, the modern welfare state is being undermined by globalisation. Tax competition has lowered corporate income tax revenues and will soon put pressure on VAT revenues. Meanwhile, the mobility of individuals will prevent governments from substantially increasing income taxes, particularly on high earners. Whilst you know, we heard earlier today that uh, increasing taxes on the so-called rich, you know, tax avoidance stuff, what we actually observed when we introduced the 50p rate was a very low revenue take compared to what was expected. It's simply economically illiterate in our modern world to expect anything otherwise. 
The other component of globalization, which probably uh, many of you will be surprised by me bringing up, is migration. And whilst proponents of large-scale immigration no doubt suspected it would strengthen support for social democratic ends, it has in fact had the reverse effect. And that's because it's highlighted to people that there's a lack of a contributory uh, principle within our welfare system. Now, the stats actually show that most immigrants who come to this country are actually net contributors to the state. But the fact that you could technically come to the state and be a net recipient having not contributed anything, many British people consider to be unfair. But should these three different forces I've described concern us? Well, if you start with the idea that the state exists to right all social wrongs rather than create a framework for us to live our own lives, then you can never find any justification for saying no to more spending on welfare and so or social programmes. But that's not what I believe. As one famous American president once said, there are no easy answers, but there are simple ones. The conundrum of protecting the poor whilst not killing the economy with incentive-destroying taxes can only be solved in the longer term by a shift back towards the liberal concept of the state, whose role is to protect the public, provide public goods, and to provide a safety net. And when I say safety net, I mean a genuine safety net, not one which allows people to fall through as the homeless people I pass every morning in Victoria Station, whilst Bob Crow is seen fit for social housing. A radically streamlined state which provides safety net provision of welfare and social programmes for those in genuine need, but which replaces universality by encouraging saving, personal provision and mutual assistance would be more affordable whilst leaving space for the economy to grow. problems that you've identified stem from either excessive bureaucracy, abuse, or a specific misallocation of resources within the welfare system. So surely, if those obstacles are overcome through um, very targeted reform and decentralization, the premise remains intact and therefore worthy of sustainability. That is, that the most vulnerable members of society deserve the protection provided by a welfare state. No? That's not what we're talking about here this evening. We're talking about whether the modern welfare state is sustainable. As you've already heard from my friend here, um, actually there are many people far up the income scale. I've just used the example of Bob Crow um, in social housing. There are many people that receive benefits and tax credits that actually in my system, where you have a genuine safety net for the very poor, but then enable people to top up, have lower tax rates, but enable people to top up, to top up with personal provision, um, uh, and personal insurance schemes and allow, allow civil society to operate in the way that it used to. That's my vision of the state. I don't think this is just about bureaucracy. I don't think um, this is just about the forces that you've described. It's actually more profound than that. It's due to the demographic pressures that are coming. It's going to mean that what modern welfare state is unsustainable and the fact that globalisation is undermining tax revenues. Yes, sir. If you're going to give benefits only to people who can't afford to cope by themselves. Are you going to take away my pension? Unfortunately, um, well, fortunately for your generation, I think your pension will be fine. But we're going to have to come to a point where we're going to have to decide with an ageing population what we're going to do. And unfortunately, it's our generation that's going to have to pay twice. Not only are we going to be paying the, the uh, for the pension provisions of our parents because we have a pay-as-you-go system. But due to the demographic effect that I've spoken about and the effect that that's going to have on growth if we increase taxes, we're going to have to pay for our own prov provision privately at the same time. So our generation is going to suffer. And our ge generation is going to suffer because the modern welfare state is set up in such a way that without massively increasing taxes and destroying the economy, we're going to have huge debts. And that's what I spoke about earlier on tonight. We are effectively, our welfare state is effectively about redistributing the future to the present. We're going to suffer from that. The state that I envisage would absolutely target absolute de deprivation, not the left-wing fads for relative poverty and enforced equality. It would require those who are on benefits to work in order to restore incentives, and over the medium term, it would instead encourage more personal responsibility and strengthen the role of the family and civil society institutions, which have been so undermined by welfare over the last 70 years. When William Beveridge first set up the welfare state, he set out his ideals very clearly. 
I'm just going to read this quote to you. He said, the state in organizing security should not stifle incentive, opportunity, or responsibility. In establishing a national minimum, it should leave room for encouraging voluntary action for each individual to provide more than this minimum for himself and his family. This isn't the vision of the welfare state that Beveridge had. But the unsustainability, which is the key point of this motion, the unsustainability of the state provision we now have will soon mean we inevitably have to move back towards William Beveridge's ideals. And I, th I hope we do so sooner rather than later for our generation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now to continue for the opposition, we have Tom Belger, a third-year PPS student at Churchill College whose research is focused on the welfare state. Tom. The wonderful thing about William Beveridge is he said so much you can back up just about any position but I think if there's one thing that wasn't in his vision, it's heartless neoliberal extremists quoting him. But thank you very much. <laughs> I want to begin by talking to you, or by arguing even, that the real unsustainability of the welfare state has been wildly exaggerated, and that the real unsustainability actually lies in the rogue landlords, the rubbish wages, and the mass unemployment that are driving up costs. Now, I know you didn't come here expecting to or wanting to listen to a battle of statistics, but I think there are a few simple things you really need to know if we want to have this debate in an informed way. So who wants to get the public? The public think that 27% of the overall welfare bill is lost to fraud. Does anyone want to take a guess at what the real figure is? Less than 1%. Absolutely. It's 0.7%. 0.7% of the overall welfare bill is lost to fraud. Another question for you. What percentage of the welfare bill do we actually think is going towards the unemployed? Someone take a guess. Someone take another guess. <laughs> it's 3%. Absolutely, it's tiny. It's a tiny proportion. Most people who are receiving benefits are in work, as my colleague said. The reason that they're, in, the reason that they're getting benefits is that they're not earning enough uh, and the state is having to step in to subsidize it. And the unemployed, the unemployed aren't living in luxury either. That's something that we're frequently told. People, people are now surviving on unemployment benefits on half the amount they were getting in 1970. Half the amount. And I hope the proposition will have the decency to admit they couldn't live on £53 a week, as Ian Duncan Smith mistakenly claimed. Uh, yeah, go on. But many people aren't, most people aren't just living on uh, job seekers' allowance because they also receive tax credits, they also receive housing benefit, they also receive these vast amounts of benefits that we've heard from my friend that just didn't exist in the 70s. So it's a completely false comparison to look at the real value of the job seekers' allowance between now and 1970. I'm afraid I don't accept that it's not a real comparison. If you're a single unemployed male, as I am, in 1970 you would be receiving exactly the same benefits as you are now. And as I said, for the person I mentioned who went to the food bank, they were receiving various benefits, and it didn't mean that it was getting them out of poverty. They still had nothing in their cupboard, so I don't really accept that point. Um, <clears throat> we can see, therefore, that benefit cheats and unemployment aren't really the issue at hand here. And so just keep those figures in mind when you're listening to anything that the opposition tell you about the unsustainability. 0.7% loss to fraud, 3% going to the unemployed. Now, the other side will also tell you, they have told you, that spending is up dramatically. But spending has been remarkably stable as a proportion of GDP and as a proportion of tax for 20 years. That's a fact. And where spending has gone up, as you highlighted, it's predominantly been pensioners. It hasn't been the scroungers. It hasn't been the feckless, reckless scroungers. And no one tells you that. No one tells you that because no one really seems to want... No, sorry, I haven't got time. No one really seems to want to tell you that because no one wants our grandmas to, to starve. Now, spending, spending has risen in other areas. Spending risen in areas like housing benefit, and it's risen in areas like working tax credits. But it's been ludicrously exaggerated. Ludicrously exaggerated. And I also want to point out that where it's risen, where it's risen, it's not been about the lavish lifestyles at the bottom, and it's not been about lavish spending habits at the top. 
It's a product of far, far deeper problems. And this is my main point I want to come on to now. There's three issues here. Greedy landlords, low wages, and high unemployment. <coughs> now, rogue landlords, rogue landlords are milking their tenants, and ruthlessly. Private rents shot up 300 pounds last year. And when rents go up, so does housing benefit. Tenants don't get a penny of that money. It's going straight to landlords. In France and in Germany, and even in New York, they have systems so that the amount that rent can increase is limited. In Britain, private renters have absolutely no idea when their rents are going to go up. They have no idea how much their rents are going to go up. And they have no idea if they're going to be priced out or kicked out of their homes. So if you stop rogue landlords, you can tackle some of the benefits built. But what's driven up welfare most recently is low pay. That's the real issue. Most people in poverty have jobs, as I said. They get housing and working tax credits to top up pathetic incomes. Now, New Labour did spectacularly well at making work pay for the filthy rich, but it spectacularly failed to do so for people on low incomes. Their wages haven't risen for 10 years. The real, real value of the minimum wage is at its lowest in 10 years. Yeah. If the modern welfare system traps those genuinely deserving in a system of low wages and unemployment, as was highlighted by the first speaker on the government bench, doesn't that indicate that it's in fundamental need of reform and hence that it's unsustainable? I think you're missing the point of my argument that it's not the, un the welfare state that's unsustainable, it's the greedy landlords, it's the unemployment, and it's the low wages. These are the real problems, not the welfare state. The welfare state is the symptom and not the cause. So the root of the problem, the root of the problem, as I've just indicated, is the moral bankruptcy of employers. That's what it is. That's the reason wages are so low. It's the, mor it's the moral bankruptcy of employers who are happy to treat their employees with such little dignity that thousands of people in work are now turning to food banks every single week. It's that moral bankruptcy that means one in five mothers regularly goes without meals to feed their children. So we have to question, who's really being feckless here? Who are the real skivers scrounging off the hard work of other peoples? And why is it, why is it that employers have to be forced by law or by tax rates to, in, to pay a living wage? It's a disgrace. And it's a disgrace that the proposition's party, or the party that they support, don't have the guts to tackle employers and to, recog or to recognize that they should have the humanity and the intelligence to realize this is the real problem that needs to be addressed, not the welfare state. No, sir, I don't have time to take any more questions. Finally, I want to talk a bit more about why, in, uh, why the welfare state in the longer term has been relatively expensive rather than in recent years. Now, both Tories and New Labour have blamed the unemployed with sanctions, with stigma, and the odd retraining scheme if they're lucky. But such narrow thinking is completely ignoring the elephant in the room, mass unemployment. And it's us, it's us who are letting them get away with it by, not, by focusing on the question of are they scroungers, aren't they scroungers? The underlying premise of the entire debate is that if you can work, if you go out there and work hard, you can get a job. Now, that might be true for some of us, but for millions of people in this country, that is a complete lie. It's a fiction, and it's a fantasy. The government's own figures show that there are two and a half million people unemployed in this country. How many jobs do you think there are available? 400,000. That's a phenomenal and criminal lack of jobs available. And those jobs, those jobs that are available, they're not equally accessible to all. They're not evenly spread across the country. Of course, it's the young and it's the most marginalised who are getting the worst deal. Where I live in Lewisham in South East London, there's 35 job seekers for every single vacancy. So when young people who haven't got a chance in the world of getting that job take out their fury and take out their frustration by rioting and by looting, as they did on Lewisham in 2010, you can get your police to beat them. And you can exclude them from the schools that are failing them. And you can starve them with sanctions when they don't take interviews for jobs they're not going to get. And you can subject them to the vile, racist indignity. No, sir, I haven't got time. You can subject them to the vile, racist indignity of stop and search week in, week out for the crime of being black. And if you had the decency to do so, you could even give them proper training qualifications. But it won't, sorry, I don't have time to take any more points. It won't change a fucking thing because there aren't enough jobs. That's the reason millions of people who could work can't work. That's the problem we need to really address. And so to bring my speech to a close, remember the real story, not the myths put foot forward by the newspapers and the party and the proposition. Remember the real problems, sorry, remember the real problems of greedy uh, landlords, of mass unemployment and of low wages that are causing the issue, not the narrowly focused motion that we're debating tonight. 
And ask yourself, ask yourself if there's really anything inevitable about the wealth the welfare cuts. 18 billion pounds being cut, when 32 billion pounds is being lost every single year in tax avoidance. And ask yourself, finally, whether we can actually trust the opposition's party on these matters. When they were funded by 50, funded the last election in 2010, 50% by the city, 50%. It's fundamentally wrong. It's fundamentally wrong that you are prepared to blame the poorest for the crisis and make them pay for the bankers' crisis. If you agree with that, I urge you to oppose this motion. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we're now going to return to the floor for another round of floor speeches. So would anyone like to make a speech in proposition of the motion? Up there. I'm sure a figure some of you will be aware of is that the UK's total unfunded liabilities, when you take, when you take into account the, the, the pensions and he health benefits the government owes people um, who, who, have, who have paid into them and who will have to pay out in the future, come to more than 400% of GDP and have been growing. We have been taking on additional um, debt in the form of what, what we owe our future population year after year after year, and that cannot continue. And this, this is not an ideological debate about whether, whether or not the welfare state, welfare state should exist. Um, the, the opinion of the gentleman in proposition about their, ide their ideologies is not, neither here nor there in this debate. It's a debate about whether or not we can sustain what we are currently doing. And given our demographics, given what's going to happen to our population and, and how much more needy, on average, everyone in the population is going to become because of, because of, our, of the ageing nature of it, and we cannot con continue to take on additional liabilities like we have been for the last 10 years. Thank you. Could I get a speech in opposition to the motion? Anyone disagree with the motion? Oh, please. For those of you who were with us in the chamber for the uh, emergency debate, I talked about different flavors of propaganda and how we make fun of their stupid propaganda because it's not as good as ours. Ours is high budget. Um, it's from our best graduates and uh, it's uh, associated with our leaders. So, uh, of course, we are right to be proud of our propaganda. Phrases like um, economically illiterate, and an economic illiteracy is almost always going to be a beautiful bit of propaganda from a very high-placed member of society. Um, we had stuff like appeals to American presidents, which, as an American, I would uh, probably not find to be particularly useful. Um, we had <laughs> phrases like the basic decency of the British people, and also uh, allusions to many British people believe, and... Uh, basic inversion, inversions of cause and effect, which is an important purpose of propaganda. And then we have stuff like downplaying the Daily Mail and then citing their viewpoints as an important uh, uh, case in your argument. Stuff like that. So there are different flavors. Certainly ours is much higher budget, and I think we should be proud of our propaganda here in the West. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Could I get a speech in abstention of the motion? So, first of all, I want to say, whilst I, I believe that the British and also the US uh, welfare systems are, are unsustainable, mainly due to the accompanying costs of, of ageing, which I don't think the opposition have dealt with, I want to ask a more a real broader question of what about the modern welfare state across the world in general? And I'd like people to maybe consider what are actually more sustainable welfare states uh, for example, like the ones uh, in countries like Denmark, Scandinavian countries, which are not actually particularly progressive, but are more a form of insurance against the volatility of the free market, uh, and also which accompany a very strong Lutheran work ethic. But also compare that to, say, the light, uh, welfare light of, uh, of uh, top-ups on individual contributions of states like Chile and Singapore, which have seen extremely, extremely fast growth, increasing welfare for all of their population. And, and it's worth remembering, Lee Kuan Yew, who designed the Singapore system, was a former Fabian who realized that the British welfare state was, was going to cause a, the stagflation of the 1970s and also saw the additional drive uh, of Hong Kong, which lacked a welfare state, and how that allowed uh, most people to increase their welfare there. So I, I wonder if we could have more of a broader debate 
on these issues. Thank you, and we'll do one final round. Would anyone else like to make a speech in proposition? Johnny Davidson, St. Catharines College. I'd just like to say that if 5% of the um, current benefits are going to people out of work, the most need in our society, surely that is unsustainable. And if there are so few jobs, why are there so, so few unemployed Polish people? Why are you paying Romanians to go to Lincolnshire to pick stuff? To pick? I'm not against that. My dad was Eastern European. But why are we paying for them to go there? Why, why aren't Man people from Manchester willing to get the bus down to Lincolnshire to pick fruits and things? But more importantly, 5% going to unemployed, the most needy, 95% to people who have jobs. Surely that is unsustainable. Thank you. Could I get a speech in opposition of the motion? Uh, Tom Arnold, Trinity Hall. We've spoken to a great extent about benefits, but this is by... Um, it, it, it's a misrepresentation to present this as the only component of a welfare state. A welfare state is comprised of a whole series of different methods of social engineering that are nothing to do with supporting the unemployed um, or supporting even the employed as they try to meet the costs of living. Uh, the Philpot case was mentioned broadly irrelevantly at some point and I think what that demonstrates is that um, our systems of child protection are on occasion woefully inadequate. We had baby pee cases and, and, and things like this very recently which suggest that we need to increase uh, investment in other welfare systems I also want to briefly throw out the point that comes due to uh, John Maynard Keynes that welfare spending is not always necessarily economically imprudent, but can actually generate economic growth. Thank you. And finally, could I get a speech in abstention of the motion? There in the red T-shirt. Felix, Sydney Sussex College. Uh, I think we've heard a lot uh, about essentially benefits today and about the moral desirability of those on benefits, whether uh, the welfare system works to support them, whether it's necessary for these people uh, in order to get on in life or whether they'd be left destitute otherwise. Uh, but the real question is surely an empirical one. Will the, wave, will, will the Wayfair state, as it is today, with the current benefits, healthcare, education, pensions, be fiscally sustainable? And I think the gentleman up there made a good point that I'd like to see perhaps address more about the liabilities, about the ageing population that we have here in this country. And surely this is a, a question about whether the trajectory we're carrying on can be continued if we have growth and all these other things, or whether there do need to be reforms and what those reforms need to be in making the system more sustainable in the future. Thank you. And now to close for the proposition, I'm delighted to introduce Chris Skidmore. Chris is a Conservative MP and widely read historian, as well as having co-authored a study entitled Britannia Unchained, looking at the state of the UK workforce. Chris. Thank you very much. I think in, the, in that last round of, quest, of uh, points from the floor, we finally got to the nub of what this debate should be about. We've heard sort of the words ideology and propaganda being banded around. In reality, there is an increasing consensus among all political parties that the welfare state that was established by Beveridge 70 years ago in 1942, the publication of the Beveridge Report, is no longer sustainable for the 21st century. And Ryan and a couple of other gentlemen from the floor touched upon this point of an aging population. The debate seems to focus around benefits and unemployment benefits. In reality, and what I'm about to say may be an uncomfortable truth, but our generation, and I'm sure there'll be people in this audience who look to become politicians of the future, our generation must face up to the fact that our welfare state as it stands is simply unsustainable given the demographic challenge that we face. And I'll hold my hand up, you know, I'm a Conservative MP, but I'm not making this party political. All parties at the moment 
have not got the guts to face up to the challenge that you and I will have to pick up. When we look at when Beveridge set up the welfare state and published his report in 1942, life expectancy was 69. He was calculating for only four years of pensionable age. Now, life expectancy is now 78.5 years for men and 82.6 years for women. And that's going to rise to 87 years for women in 2033 and 83.3 um, uh, years for men in 2035. We're going to be in a situation in 2030 where 23.6% of the population will be over 65, up from 16% today. And one of my, it's not a favourite statistic, but one of the most compelling statistics for the challenge we face was that in 1952, the Queen signed 250 letters congratulating people on turning 100. Last year, she signed 7,800. Now, it's a great thing that people are living longer, but it does present the challenge of how we deal with that aging population and how the welfare state is un not able to contain itself with the creaking structure that we face the 21st century. Ryan mentioned the fact, yes. Yeah, and you made a very good point that I think no one here would disagree that we need a welfare state, but that in itself is at risk of being undermined by the fact we have an aging population. So what do we do about it? We've got a situation where at the moment we have a universal welfare state, apart from the fact that the coalition has decided to chink, take a chunk out of the universal principle by saying for those families that are earning over between 50 and 60,000 pounds a year, you'll no longer get child benefit. Okay. I actually agree with that. I do not believe that the universal principle of the welfare state should exist. That is why I believe that if we continue with the universal principle, it's unsustainable. But why not let us look at wealthy pensioners, for example? There are 988,000 pensioners who've got assets over a million pounds. There are, um, I think, in terms of pensioners who actually have an income of over 100,000 pounds a year, there are 100,000 pensioner households. Now, I do not believe it is morally right that an MP who retires on a final salary pension of £65,000 a year should be eligible for winter fuel allowance, should be eligible for a free TV licence, should be eligible for a free bus pass. We need to have the courage to look at these wealthy pensioner benefits. Yes. Uh, James Mott from Selwyn College. Now, I campaigned for the Conservative Party in 2010 and I can't count the number of times I stood on a pensioner's doorstep and told them, don't listen to those leaflets you're getting from Labour. We're going to increase your pension. We're not going to touch your winter fuel allowance. We're not going to touch your free bus pass. And I don't want my party to turn me into a liar retroactively. I'm not a Liberal Democrat. Yeah. No, I agree. <laughs> I agree. And I, I, was, I was there too. I was on the doors, and the literature that got put out was vitriolic, sort of saying that, you know, savage Tories were going to cut, 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 cut. But we have a situation where I think we've got to create a narrative where we say to pensioners, you know, we've protected them for this parliament, maybe we grandfather this scheme in so that ourselves as pensioners, I mean, to what, when are we going to be retiring? If you look at Scandinavian countries, they've actually introduced a rolling system in order to deal with pensions and bring in pensions later. The pension age has moved to 67. I get lots of aggrieved constituents talking about the future pension changes, but this is the reality we face, because it will be their grandchildren that will be paying for it out of their taxes in the future. And this is what we need to grasp if we are going to ensure that the welfare state remains sustainable. Other countries, actually, Social democracies have done it. If you look at Germany, Schroeder, for instance, in 2003, you know, they went in to limit pensions and went in to raise this pension age. And Schroeder said, we will have to limit the state's contribution, promote personal responsibility, and dem demand more initiative for each individual. Now, there were 5 million unemployed people in 2005. There are now 3 million unemployed people people in 2012 in Germany. In Sweden, they've gone far further than we would ever envisage actually in Britain with healthcare, with co-payments. And it is the NHS that we will have to look at closely when we look at the, the amount of money that's going into the NHS. You know, it's 112 billion pounds at the moment. The IMF reckon in 2050, it's gonna be 250 billion pounds. We have an aging population and we know that 70% of that 
um, money spent in the NHS is spent on those over 75. So what do we do about it? We've got a situation where diabetes is on the increase, comorbidities are on the increase, long-term conditions. The way we tackle the NHS and spend in order to make sure it remains sustainable for those who need it is to move to a system of personal budgets where we empower individuals to take control of their health care. That does not take place at the moment with our bureaucratic top-down welfare system. I believe, to sum up, that the welfare state, as it stands, worked very well in the 20th century, but it is no longer the answer for the 21st century. When it comes to health care, when it comes to pensions, you, us, we will need to look at this in the longer term, far longer than the current generations of politicians are doing so. Because if we want to ensure that our children are yet to be born, Ryan talked about that contract, the contract between the living and those who are yet to be born, that actually we need to take difficult decisions now if we're going to ensure the welfare state can survive. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now our final speaker tonight for the opposition is Stephen Timms, a Labour Member of Parliament and a former Minister at the Department for Work and Pensions. Stephen. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. I think the question before us tonight is whether we choose to sustain a modern welfare system or not. We have a choice, and the argument that we want to make on this side is that we should choose to sustain such a, a system. I, it isn't enough, it seems to me, for the proposers to argue simply that we need to make some changes to the system. Nobody would dispute that. Of course, changes need to be made, and demography is one of the reasons for that. And it sounded to me as though Chris was really conceding the argument when he said that nobody here will disagree that we should have a modern welfare state. I mean, that's the case that we've been making. We should have a welfare state. Of course, there need to be some changes, but we should maintain a modern welfare state. We're spending today about £200 billion a year on Social Security in the UK. Over half of that goes to pensioners. It isn't the case, as somebody suggested, that 95% goes to people in work. Over half of that 200 billion goes to pensioners, as we've heard, just 3% uh, or so paid out in job seekers' uh, allowance. And uh, I think it was Freddie who made the point that's about a quarter of all government uh, spending. Now, the go this government has come up with one or two good ideas for changes to the system, and I'll come back to those. But it is also doing some terrible things at the moment. The hated bedroom tax is... Uh, I'm delighted to give way on that point. Does the Honourable Gentleman the difference between a tax and a subsidy? It's pretty basic. It, for, those who, for those who are on the receiving end, this is a tax. Go and talk to some of them. If you've suddenly been deemed by the government to have more bedrooms than you should have, your income, is your housing benefit, is cut by 14% if it's one bedroom, 28%. If it's two, I was speaking to a, a, a widow in my constituency uh, two weeks ago whose position is suddenly unsustainable. There is nowhere she can move to. There aren't any smaller places available for her to go to. This is a terrible device simply to take money away from people who've already got very little and uh, it's rightly, in my view, um, hated. Um, the uh, extraordinary proliferation at the moment of benefit sanctions. We heard a little bit about that uh, earlier on. The number of sanctions issued to people for alleged breaches of some benefit rule or other has gone up tenfold since the general election. It is certainly one of the major reasons why people are being driven to uh, church-led food banks at the moment. 350,000 people in the past year have had to go to one of those because they haven't been able to uh, afford to buy food for themselves or their families. It's very often, according to the people who run the food banks, because they've had a benefit sanction, and generally they have no idea what the reason for that sanction is. All they know is they've suddenly stopped getting uh, money. I want to suggest three reasons, though, why we should choose to sustain a, a modern welfare state. <laughs> Firstly, because there is a, a settled view in Britain that every person is entitled to a free, a, a, a fair chance in life. And I think that view is right. The Christian faith has taught us that. Freddie uh, was rather um, uh, critical of somebody for being pious early on, but actually piety has told us some valuable lessons, and that is one of them. Without 
uh, a welfare state, large numbers of our fellow citizens would be doomed to penury and would be unable to do anything at all uh, about it. Secondly, because inexorably escalating inequality and real hardship being endured by a growing number damages all of us, not those who are at the bottom of the pile. And Kate's work in her uh, book with, uh, with, with uh, Richard Wilkinson, The Spirit Level, has powerfully illuminated the extent to which gross inequality drives serious ills in our society of every kind, affecting uh, everybody in our society. And thirdly, because social security supports prosperity. Those who argue that a social security system is incompatible with prosperity when we're competing with Hong Kong and China should just take a look at, at Germany. Berlin today is unmistakably the capital city of an economic powerhouse and Germany is a modern welfare state. And the consequences of the economic crisis that we've been through in the absence of the automatic stabilizers provided by our modern welfare system would have been far worse and would have severely reduced our future uh, economic potential. But none of this is to argue that everything should be left as it is. That is not the case from this side of the House at all. There should be changes, and demograph demography is one of them. It should be continuously modernised, and must be if it is to, 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 to be sustained and to, to continue. And the two major changes I want to suggest... Uh, yes, sir. Um, Stephen, I hope you don't mind saying, but I, I wonder if you've, you've misread the the motion here, because it's not this House believes in the welfare state, yes or no, it's this House believes the welfare state is unsustainable. And if you're accepting that there needs to be change, then you must also, quid pro quo, be accepting that in a current fashion it is unacceptable, is unsustainable and needs to change as a result. I can well understand why Chris would like that to be the motion, but I don't think it is the motion at all. Nobody is suggesting that the current system should be set in aspic and should never change. No person would argue uh, that. And, 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 of course, it's easy to denounce such a view because it would be uh, a nonsense. The system needs continuously to be modernised and must be. But we should be sustaining a modern welfare state. That's what Germany has, that's what we should have. And it needs to, uh, uh, of course, be uh, kept uh, uh, up, up to date. But the two changes I want to argue for uh, are, are this. Firstly, it should be more contributory. There should be a sense that if you pay in all your working life, then you will be entitled to receive support when you need it. And the changes being made at the moment, some of the changes being made at the moment, are very damaging to that, in particular, the fact that uh, under the changes that uh, had been made to employment and support allowance, if you've been paying in your whole working life, have to give up work because of a health problem, you will in future only receive contributory benefit for 12 months, which means if you've got a spouse earning more than £8,000 a year, you will get absolutely nothing after 12 months, even though we know most people in that situation will not be in a position to return to work uh, within 12 months. The system should feel a contributory uh, system, and we're moving away from that um, at the moment. Um, but the, the other change I want to argue for um, is this, and that is that the system should be better geared to directing people into employment. Now, the government uh, the new universal credit, and Freddie uh, referred to this earlier on, is intended to make it uh, easier, clearer to people that they are better off if they go into it. I think that is a, a good idea. There are, as Freddie also indicated, serious questions about just how long it's going to take to get this new system working. And ministers were rather naive, I think, to believe it was all going to be up and running fully by this year. But the principle is a perfectly uh, sensible one. But here's another good idea. Youth unemployment at the moment, costing Britain over a billion pounds a year in job seekers allowance, over three billion if you take account of the long-term scarring on individuals of long periods out of work in youth, uh, redu reducing their future economic potential. Before the election, we had in place the, the Future Jobs Fund. That guaranteed uh, young people who've been out of work for uh, 12 months a six-month job paying at least the national minimum wage 
Um, yeah, and what that, that, that was uh, available to them once they'd been out of work for a year. Youth unemployment, as a result, fell in the teeth of the recession. Wherever I go now, people tell me what a great job the Future Jobs Fund did, particularly those who were participants in it. Yes, gladly. Just the honour of gentlemen, oh, sir. As, as much as you might like this to be a party political debate about what the coalition have done right and wrong, that's just not the issue at hand. The issue is whether the welfare system as we have it now is sustainable, not about how you'd be doing it differently. Well, I, I'm, I, I'm describing what the welfare state should be doing in order to be sustainable, and helping young people into work is, should be right at the top of the, the list. And, uh, yes, I will. As, and I quote, you're saying um, that you're describing what the welfare state should be doing in order that it can be sustainable, I presume, therefore, you agree that the welfare state in its current form is unsustainable, no. and that, as such, you agree with the motion, and you should really be on the other bench. No, no, that is a... <laughs> yes. I think that is a complete non-sequitur. As I have repeatedly said, nobody is arguing that the system should be set in aspic and never changed. It needs to be continuously uh, changed. What I'm describing is what it should be doing. And get, as I say, getting young people into work should be uh, at the, the top of the, uh, the list. The, the, the current government published an evaluation of the Future Jobs Fund just before Christmas. One of the interesting things that it said was the total cost, £750 million pounds of that uh, scheme. More than half of that came back because people started to pay taxes and they stopped claiming benefits. Um, the, the Future Jobs Fund gave 100,000 young people a chance. That is what the modern welfare state should be doing. It is sustainable, and we should choose to sustain it because we need it. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you to all of our speakers for taking part tonight. Just a brief reminder before everyone leaves, voting will be occurring through the door by which you exit. Eyes to my right and nays to the left with the results in the bar in 15 minutes. Another brief reminder of what's coming up this week at the Union. Tomorrow night we'll be hosting John Boyne, the author of The Boy in the Striped Pyjamas. On Monday night we'll be hosting David Moyes, who after today needs no introduction at all. And on Tuesday night we'll be hosting the Formula One legend Sir Jackie Stewart. Next Thursday's debate with speakers including the founder of Wikipedia, Jimmy Wales, the supermodel, Lily Cole, and David Halpern, who was chief strategist at number 10, will be looking at moving beyond markets and whether a society of giving is impossible. Thank you very much for all for coming tonight. <laughs>